everyone, and uh, welcome to this 2022 Linton series. It is good to be back together after a couple years of weirdness and hiatus, and uh, glad to, glad to have you all. So we're here. We've got about 18, 20 people in the room, and many more on Zoom. Um, what I want to do this Lent, this Linton series, is because we are uh, becoming a Matthew 25 congregation, and that one of the issues with Matthew 25 is to address the disunity that is present in our culture, but also in our churches due to, to racism and other isms that are out there. And to look at a doctrine, in my mind, the most important doctrine of the Christian faith, which is grace, and then grace's implications for the church, and how grace should unify us not tear us apart. It should draw us across all all lines. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to do this for four Tuesday nights. So there'll be three more uh, following this evening. We'll be together for somewhere between probably 50 minutes and 60 minutes, and then I promise I'll turn you loose and you can be on your way before eight or maybe even a little little before that. So let's, uh, if you would, if you bow with me and let's uh, let's pray and ask for God's blessing and help as we as we grow and learn and self-examine together. So let us pray. So gracious God, on this uh, first night of our time together during Lent, we give you thanks for this day, and we ask that our hearts and our minds would be open that we would learn and grow in the ways that we need to. So as we look at scripture, as we look at history, as we look at these confessional documents, God help us um, to just come into a thanksgiving for your grace that covers the world and for what that grace calls us to do and to be. God, our hearts continue to be heavy for um, people in Ukraine. And so as we gather tonight, may our hearts and our spirits also resonate with them that that peace may come to that weary and war-torn place. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's let's uh, get rolling. And I want to begin with the doctrine of grace, which as I said is probably my favorite thing to preach about and I think in many ways it is the most important aspect of our, our our Christian doctrine so if I were to ask you or if somebody were to ask you what is grace what is all this grace all you Christians talk about all the time what is it what's that mean what is grace so I'm not asking for deep theological definitions but what what do you think when I say the word grace how do you respond what is it what do you think? Love. Love. Thanks, Joe. Love. Okay, hold it. <laughs> it's unearned. Yeah. Okay, so love. And somebody said unearned. Yeah. Who said that? Good job, Gail. You get a gold star. <laughs> unearned. <laughs> it's so, something you don't earn. What else? Kind. Kindness. Kindness. Yes. I'm trying to find it bigger here. Oh, is that permanent? No. Okay. I don't think so, but it's scary. No, but it looks black. So. Here we go. This is the one I'm looking for. Um, okay, what, what's that? that? Kindness. 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 What else? Blessings. Blessings. What else? What other words come to mind? With Tenderness. What? Tenderness. Tenderness. Yeah, those are all wonderful words. Mercy. Mercy. What else? Acceptance. Oh, that's another good one, Joe. Do you get a second gold star? <laughs> no, she didn't. No, I didn't get the first one. <laughs> the first gold star. I don't remember now. I did. Gail did. Okay. Um, what was the word again? I'm sorry. Acceptance. <laughs> Acceptance. Yeah. These, these are all these are all absolutely pertaining to grace, which makes me feel like you guys are listening to something I've been saying. What else? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, I think that's sufficient. So, grace. 
these are all words that help describe it. But most theolo theologians say that grace is, first of all, an attribute of God. Grace is one of God's attributes. Okay. Now I want to... Um, one theologian, Millard Erickson, who is a Presbyterian, said that... Um, who, he's now dead, but he said that the attribute of God of grace says that, that God's love for us, God's welcome for us, is unearned. It's, it just is, right? It's just there. It doesn't come because of anything we do. It's just there. It's a part of who God is. God, God's love, God's grace, God's welcome, God's kindness, God's acceptance, God's mercy. All these words, you see, you've chosen good words. That's a part of grace. And it's an attribute of God. But when we start talking about the doctrine of grace, that's where we get into the discussion. We start using words about something being unearned and unmerited. Okay? Which means that God's grace comes to us by God's choice. It's God's choice. It's God's doing. It's not because we've done anything. It just, it just is. And I want to read to you now from um, Shirley Guthrie, another Presbyterian who describes grace like this. I've got to get my glasses on. Sorry, guys. I can't see anymore. Um, <clears throat> grace seems complicated to us only because it just sounds too good to be true. Grace is a gift. And he references Romans chapter 324. Grace is a gift. It means it quite simply. You do not have to try to buy God's love and acceptance because you are already loved and accepted by God without qualification or prerequisites. God does not say, I will love you if you are good, if you prove yourself worthy, if you do so, so and so, if you love me first. God does not even say, I will love you if you first have faith in me, or if you first humiliate yourself and grovel on the ground before me. But God does say this, I love you just as you are. I love you. Not your righteousness, not your humility, not your faith, not your accomplishments of one kind or another. <clears throat> those, of, those of you who had parents who, who acted in such a way that made you feel that you had to work for their love, people like that, for them, the doctrine of grace is very difficult. It does sound too good to be true because they were raised in an atmosphere where you received praise, love, affection if you did something. If you did something. For people like that, the doctrine of grace is a very difficult thing to embrace, let alone understand. It just sounds too good to be true. I, I sort of think about grace as being um, sort of the way the very, very finest, most loving, most giving, most tender parents could be towards a child. You love them, even if they grow up to be a serial killer, right? You, lo you love that child. You don't love what they do. But you still love you still love them. Their bad behavior, their mistakes, doesn't somehow get in the way of the fact that you love them. You may not approve of them, but you love them and you embrace them and you want the best for them in the end. Does that that's starting to get at the doctrine of God's grace? Okay, the doctrine of God's grace. All right. Now, if 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 God loves us and if God relates to us like that, what sort of implications does that have for the way we react 
and respond and relate to one another. Especially in the church. Or for people who are trying to be faithful to God. What are the implications? Yes, Gail. Well, I think the implications are uh, it should show us that we should not be looking at others and judging how they're living their lives, what they're doing. And we should be making efforts to extend love and tenderness and mercy to others without judgment. Very good. Very good. That's good. Anybody else? What else? What would be some of the implications? Yeah, Mike, I think maybe if we kind of express some of those implications in our welcoming statement. Try to. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, right? Yeah. The, yeah. You know, God first welcomed every, everyone, all of us. Yeah. So we try to respond in kind. Exactly. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. So if God acts Make like that. Make sure that everybody can hear that. Okay, what Ted said is that if, if God is like this, if God, res if God treats us like that, we need to respond in kind, not only to God, but with each other, right? All right? With each other. If God looks at us like that, if God loves, and, and there's disagreement here. Not, not all uh, Christians, not all Christian theologians um, understand grace to be equally poured out on all. Which is most unfortunate, but it's true. But let's, let, let's just assume that that's what we believe here. At least, good Lord, I hope that's what we believe. Okay, so if that's true then, if God's love is poured out equally um, on, on each person without any kind of um, condition, then one of the implications I would think would be then we cannot think of ourselves as either superior or inferior in any way, qualitatively superior or inferior to any other human being, right? If God looks at us all as children, as, as, as creations of God, then who are we then to say, yeah, but I think I'm a little bit better than that person because of this and this and this. Or I'm, or, and a lot of people do this, I'm inferior to other people because of this and this and this. That's the disconnect. Do you see? That's the disconnect I'm talking about. If God's if the doctrine of God's grace, if, God, if, if grace is really an attribute of God, then it has huge implications for the world, but for the church to be the demonstration of God's kingdom in the world. Okay? But what we all know is that that disconnect is real. And that one of the places of disconnection is with racism and there's a lot of other isms you can name them ageism sexism all that stuff but those isms get in the way and the isms we use as criteria to determine whether we are inferior or superior to another person whom we say is number one all of us are created in the image and the likeness of God, right? We're all created in the image and likeness of God. The light of God, the image of God is reflected in each person, no matter what their religion or whatever. They, they, you get that, right? You get that. You get the t-shirt. Everybody gets that, right? <laughs> and then number two, I believe, I and I, I understand that not all Christian theologians believe this, but I believe that every person is a recipient of that that grace and that love from the beginning. And I'm, I'm not talking about heaven and hell and judgment and all that. I'm, I'm saying from the beginning, from the get-go, every person, every human being, whether you're a Christian, a Muslim, whatever, 
boy, girl, gay, straight, whatever you are, from the get-go, you are a recipient. All this stuff is poured out on you, whether you know it or not, or even if you believe it or not, it is there. And I believe that that is the core of the gospel. I believe that is the good news of God that Jesus brought to the world. Now, it's more, there's more stuff to tease out, but that's the essential teaching of Jesus, okay? I'm not better than you because I'm a this or a that or that. Which is what was being taught in Jesus' day. We're superior to you in that we're the chosen ones and you're not. So sorry to be you. Yeah, you're a loser. Big loser. Okay. So, and number three, if, I'm just looking at my notes here. No one is qualitatively inferior or su superior to any other human. And then I can, you can quote that wonderful little piece of scripture in Acts where Peter says, now I get it. I love that scripture. Now I understand. Now I get it. There's, there's no God. God has no um, superior affections for any one person or any group. It's a wonderful piece of scripture. Okay, but it, 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 that does not occur to every person, as you know. Okay, that's the big disconnect. So the doctrine of grace, I believe, and ultimately what the Belhar Confession proclaims, is that the doctrine of grace and God's attributes should unify us and should speak against what is the heresy of, of racism, okay? Now, that said, is that clear? Does that make sense? Everybody get it to this point. I'm like, I'm building the argument, okay? Everybody online get it? Any questions? Okay, now, as I said earlier, we're going to look at uh, the Belhar Confession because it addresses this issue. It addresses this whole issue of disunity in the church. Disunity in the church. For them, it came out of uh, the churches in South Africa, the disunity was apartheid and racism. Okay, So we're going to get there. But before that, I think this would be a, an excellent time just to introduce you, especially if you come from a tradition other than in the Reformed tradition, <coughs> to share with you and update you a little bit about the confessional tradition within the Reformed tradition. We have these confessional documents. Some church traditions do not have them. They're non-confessing they're non churches, but in the Reformed tradition we do, okay? So we have this, these documents. I think, of the, uh, I think of the confessional documents like little cliff notes, you know? Remember Cliff Notes in college and high school? They basically gave you the meat of what a long book that you didn't want to read said, right? <laughs> and the confessional documents basically are um, a, sort of a, a, a Cliff Notes version to specific issues that are addressed in Scripture, all right? And they all, they speak to different things, these confessional documents. We're going to go through each one real quickly and talk about that. But the confessional documents, they are inferior and, and subservient to, to scripture. But they're Cliff Notes versions. They do not have the same weight as the scriptures, but they are an attempt to interpret scriptures and what God wants us to believe and to do. Does that make sense? Okay. And there are lots of confessions out there. The Lutheran Church has several. The Reformed Churches have the most, but the Lutheran Church has some confessional documents within the Protestant tradition. The Anglicans have what, Bob? The Articles of the, what do you call them? The Articles of Religion, the con Anglican Church? And I think that's the only one they have. Um, the Methodist Church, what do they have, Bob? You know. Don't you guys have one of them? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I know. I mean, they, but, I mean, the Methodists use the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Sure. But, but, uh, but I'm not sure if the Methodists actually produced confessional documents the way the Reformed Church. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But we in the Reformed Church, this is big stuff. This is really important stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So if you came from a church tradition other than Presbyterian or Reformed, this may sound new to you. And that's why I want to talk about it so that you know where this comes from. So in the, in the uh, by the way, let me start here. 
the Presbyterian Church and all Reformed churches are constitutional churches. In other words, they have a constitution. So our constitution is the Book of Confessions, which is this big fat thing, has all the confessions in it. That's the first part. And then the second part is called the Book of Order, okay? So it's part of our constitution, but this is the Book of Confessions here. So within this Book of Order, it says this about the confessions. They guide the church in its study and interpretation of scripture. They're like cliff notes. They summarize the essence of the Reformed Christian tradition. They direct the church in maintaining sound doctrines and they equip the church for proclamation. They equip the church to, for us to tell this good news, this gospel to the world. Now this, please, if you get nothing else tonight, walk out the door with this. Confessional statements emerge in a particular time, in a particular place, in response to a particular situation. So something in the history of the church, an, an issue arises, something in the civic life of a country arises, a theological crisis, many of them come out of theological crises, and then people, they sit down and they start to say, well, what does Scripture have to say about this issue or this crisis? And they go to Scripture. So a lot of these documents come out of those particular times, particular history, with a particular um, reason or situation. Okay. The other thing is this. The, do the, the uh, documents are preserved as is. So if you get in the book of confessions and you start reading like the Scots Confession, it's very stilted language. It's preserved as is. They use sometimes language that we wouldn't anymore, okay? Especially referring to God and other things. They say things that number one, we no longer agree with but they are preserved as they are because they come out of a particular time at a particular place and um, they, 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 they are a reflection of the ethical norms of the day and the cultural norms of the day. That is why, for example, in the Westminster Confession, it says specifically that women are not to do what, Cinda? Teach. Teach, teach men. Can't happen, okay? We no longer believe with that. But do we alter the Westminster Confession? No, because it's a historical document that came from that time. It doesn't rise to the level of scripture, but it does seek to interpret scripture, okay? So we preserve them as they are. Although I do understand that there are some really nasty, there were some really nasty statements in the, um, it was either the Heidelberg or the, I think it was the Scots Confession uh, against Roman Catholics. Some really snarky stuff. And it was so bad that two, two or three of those things were removed because it was so snarky that we did, it was like that's how the Scots felt about the Catholics back then, the Papists as they call them. But we don't, we don't want those kinds of relationships with our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church. So this, there, there were, of just a few passages removed, all of them had to do with really nasty attitudes of the Scottish people against the Roman Catholics. Other than that, they are preserved as they were written down. Were they, were they removed before we put them in a book of confessions? They are removed from ours. Yeah. That doesn't mean but that... They weren't removed like close to the 1500s. No, they were... They, they were, were there for 500 years. They were there for 500 years. We took them out. I don't know if that's also true, for example, the Church of Scotland, if they took them out. I bet they did. Probably. <laughs> pretty Probably. impressive. But it was, they're pretty, pretty snarky stuff. Okay. So that, the, but that was it. And I think it's only in the Scots Confession. And if you read it, the Scots Confession is pretty snarky. And you'll, you'll understand why when we go through it. Okay. So they're preserved as they are. But remember, um, you know, the, the confessions are, are a snapshot of the church in a particular place at a particular time responding to a particular issue, okay? Which means we don't have to buy everything or agree with everything theologically that's in them, 
because I don't. And I'm guessing Steve and Cinda and other ministers in the room don't either. Okay? Does that make sense? <coughs> All right. That kind of frees us up to say, you know, and you'll notice there's a there's theological evolution in the book of confessions as they go through. Okay? All right. And why is that true? Because in the Reformed tradition, we have this wonderful saying that I can't say it in Latin. Maybe Steve Resenda can. That the church is always, is the church is reformed, and it is always being reformed by the word of God. The whole idea of new light, uh, the, 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 the spirit, the spirit is, is, is walking with us as we evolve, as our minds are opened, as we learn more, you know. This was particularly true with the evolution of biblical scholarship. You know, we know we know things now about the Bible and about the culture and the history that that was going on when these things were written. That, for example, Calvin or Luther would never have known about. They just didn't have those tools or that learning back then. Okay, all right. The next thing is this: the the Presbyterian Church USA is a member of this worldwide group of reformed churches. They're, they're churches, uh, denominations, all of which trace their roots back to the Protestant Reformation within, and the reformed theological tradition, or the Calvinistic theological tradition, okay, and have Presbyterian forms of church government. This organization is called the World Communion of Reformed Churches. It used to be called the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. And all the denominations within that World Alliance have confessional documents. We share some with others. We have some that others don't. Others have some that we don't, okay? But we all have these confessional documents, all right? Our book of confessions has 12, now has 12 confessional documents, 12, all right? 12. We have 12 because the Confession of Belhar was just added to it in 2016. The General Assembly and all the Presbyteries agreed to add to our Book of Confessions the Confession of Belhar. Okay. Still clear? Any questions? Any questions from you, all you online? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm trusting this is making sense. So now let's look at our book of confessions and the 12 documents that are in there. By the way, they're not all this thick. A lot of this is in notes and references and things like that. All right, so the book of confessions are 12 historic confessional statements. The creeds and confessions arose, again, in response to a particular circumstance within the history of God's people. They claim the truth of the gospel where their authors pursue, perceived the truth to be at risk. Something happened in the life of the church that said, we have to stand up and it's, they're almost like mini sermons, or they're actually not mini, but long sermons. We have to stand up and we have to say, no, this is what we believe scripture leads us to believe and to do. They come out of these situations. When, when, when the church felt that the truth of the gospel is at risk. And remember this, people, this is why this is why no one, no one, whether minister, elder, deacon, or church member, is ever required to sign on a dotted line and say, I believe absolutely everything in this creed or that creed or this creed or all of them put together. It's never required, even of ministers, because they express the truth within the social and cultural assumptions of their time. Okay? Sandy? How is a confession created? Often, but not always, what happens is uh, a group of people, a commission is formed. Sometimes it was a king. Sometimes it was a church hierarchy. But uh, somebody says, get your heads together, 
And Constantine ordered basically the Nicene Creed. You know, when he said, you guys need to figure out who Jesus was. Get on the same page. Figure it out. Get your heads together and don't come out of there until you get it done. But often that's how it's some, a group of people are called together. The Belhar Confession, interestingly enough, was only written by two people. Two South African Reformed ministers wrote the Belhar Confession. And get this, it was something like two or three days. We'll talk more about it. Two or three days, okay? And it's an interesting story. We're going to get to that. But that's a great question. That's where it comes from. Sometimes Sandy, uh, like the Westminster Confession, um, I'm going to just say there were probably a couple hundred what they called the divines. The divines were like theologians, very important pastors, church leaders that all assembled in, at Westminster. And they were told to to produce a new statement of faith for the English-speaking Reformed people. So it can be as many... The Nicene Creed probably had something like 300 bishops that wrote that, something like that. The Westminster Confession had, let's say, a couple hundred people writing it. The Belhar Confession had two. And here's something else for you. We don't even know how the Apostles' Creed came into... We don't even know. We're not even sure. Not even sure. Joe. Is, is this also what we would call a creedal? Yeah, creedal statements, confessional statements, yeah. Creedal is probably a better, credo is a Latin word for I believe or I affirm. Confession almost sounds like I'm admitting I did something wrong. It's creedal or confessional statements. But good, we confess good. Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yeah, yeah. so it's appropriate. Yeah, to say that, yeah. yeah. But some people call them creedal statements, other people call them confessional statements. Great questions, Mike. Okay, now what are the functions? So if you're going to write this document, what's the per the function is like? What's the purpose? What are you going to do? What what do you want the outcome? How do you want this thing to be used? So there's basically five different purposes for these things. Number one, they are often used as an act of worship or praise or commitment. Not all of them, but some of them were and are. Most often they're a defense of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means right belief, correct belief. So they're trying to state or, or state what, what is true Christian doctrine. Number three, many of them are meant to be instructional things, teaching pieces, to teach the people. Things like the Westminster Confession and the longer and shorter catechisms. They were meant to instruct young people on the true doctrine of the faith. Heidelberg Catechism, same thing. They're, they're in, they're, they were instructional devices. Four, they were, they were a way to unify the people in a time of crisis, to unify a group of Christian people in a time of, of crisis, of danger, even of, of persecution. That's another function of them. And then finally, Many of them, not all, but many, especially documents like the uh, Scott's Confession and the Second Helvetic Confession. There's a there's a confession no one ever quotes as the Second Helvetic. <laughs> Confession. Um, there's a lot in there about church order and government. So so those are the functions, okay? And as we go through the twelve documents, I've tried to say what. It, what I believe is the function of them, okay? Any questions about that? All right, jump over to the next page. And this, this I found in Jack Rogers' book. Jack Rogers was a, a professor of theology at Fuller and then at San Francisco Seminaries. Great guy, died just a few years ago. Um, but he wrote this, and Stephen Sinden, you knew Jack Rogers yeah. very well. Uh, died just a few years ago, but he wrote this wonderful book. This is one of his best known about the uh, creeds and confessions. But in there, he says, <clears throat> he wanted to speak to the authority of confessions. What authority do they have? If they don't rise to the level of scripture, then what authority do they have? So he says they're provisional. And that is, they are the work of limited and fallible humans. That's why they don't rise to the level of scripture. Part, part of our 
our Reformed teaching is that we are all sinners and we are fallible, right? So we have to keep that in mind, that the people who wrote these things were not God. You know, they were fallible human beings who were limited in their understanding, in their culture, in their whatever. Number two, they're temporary. This is huge. In other words, if God is continually self-revealing to the world, new light comes, new understanding comes, new scientific breakthroughs come, new historic understandings come. So remember that. These things are, these things are temporal. They're temporal. They came out of a particular time. And they may not always be completely a correct or right or truthful way of expressing the faith. They're, they're temporal. So hold them loosely. And then finally, they're relative. And by that, he means the confessions, the creedal statements are always subordinate to Scripture. And remember this, Reformed people, that Scripture and the conscience is always subject to the living Word, that Jesus Christ is the living Word, not the Bible. Jesus Christ, as Scripture reveals Him, and as the living Christ that we all know, I hope, continues to reveal Himself to us. We, everything, Scripture, our confessions, our teaching, are subordinate to the living Word. Why do you think we pray every Sunday? We pray that our minds will be opened to the living Word as Scripture brings it to us. Okay? Now, again, not all Christian groups think like that. But we in the Reformed Church, most of us do. Not, and there are some fundamentalist Presbyterians who, who would disagree with me. But the vast majority of worldwide Reformed people, when you talk about the Word of God, they're referring to the living Christ, to, to, to the living Christ that was present in Jesus and present to us now, not the Bible as it lays on the table. Is that new to anyone? That's, that's what we believe. It comes through Scripture. The Word of God can come through the proclamation of Scripture. The living Word of God can come to you, Cindy, at a time of deep prayer. It's that, it's that insight, that revelation. Okay, thank you for your saying that. It was new to me because I was raised in the Baptist church. And for us, I, I always thought, well, the Word of God, that meant the Bible. For us in the Reformed tradition, yes, the Bible is the Word of God, but the but the, the the living Word is above that. We are subordinate to the living Word. That's why we can say we no longer think that women shouldn't teach men or that women shouldn't be ordained to the gospel ministry. But that not very long ago was what most all Christians thought. And that's why now we can say we believe if God calls a gay or a lesbian person to be a minister or an elder or a deacon, then that's the living word that we are hearing. And we understand that not everybody hears it, that they're, that they they're because they believe that the Bible says it. And the Bible does say those things, by the way. The Bible does say that. Thank you, Sidna, for nodding. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Okay. Just ask the Egyptian church. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, ready to move on? Okay, here we go. Now, my goal tonight is to get through real quickly the 12 confessions. Um, this, is, this is like down and dirty. And then next Tuesday, we'll spend the first part of our time together looking specifically at where the Belhar, there's the Belhar confession, the evolution of it is so interesting. Um, I learned stuff about the Cape and about the people in South Africa and the history of it that I never knew. I never knew. And where apartheid came from. So we're going to spend next next Tuesday, because we're not going to get to it tonight. We're going to spend next Tuesday doing that, okay? All right, so real quickly. So the first one is the Apostles' Creed. Historians think probably it looks like it, and I don't even know why, it came together sometime around 170, 185 A.D., Think about it, people. 
that is a hundred and forty, fifty years after the time and the ministry of Jesus before that creed was written, okay? And we believe the main purpose of it was to refute a very um, popular uh, heretical movement around the church called Marcionism. Marcionism. Marcion was one of the bishops. He was later be bishoped, I think. Um, he, Marcion, Marcion came up with this uh, theology that said um, there's two gods revealed in the Bible. The one in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is a mean God, a mean God, and the one in the New is a different God. Therefore, the Hebrew Bible isn't scripture at all. It shouldn't be in our Christian Bible, etc. And there's a lot more to it. But the early church, uh, the consensus was that is not the case. Marcion is wrong. It's a heresy. And we have, so they wrote, we believe, the Apostles' Creed to refute that heresy that was widespread among the early churches. Okay? So that was really, we think, the function and the purpose of that Apostles' Creed. Does it make sense? Okay. And why? Because it's, it's Trinitarian. It talks about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's trying to refute that idea that there's two gods. No, there's only one God. Okay? Second one in there is much longer. That's the Nicene Creed. There are churches who say the Nicene Creed. I think the Episcopal Church, they recite the Nicene Creed pretty much every Sunday, I think. Um, the Nicene Creed it comes about uh, in the 4th century, 325, and it was revised in 381. But basically, this comes out of the Emperor Constantine, who eventually decided that in order to keep the Roman Empire together and unify it, might as well embrace this new religion, these, these Jesus people. And then he called all the bishops together and said, you need, you need to agree. Did he really care theologically? I don't think so. I think what Constantine wanted was to keep his Roman Empire together, and that meant keeping all these crazy Christians together. By at this point, there were all kinds of heresies everywhere. And he said, so he called all the bishops of the church together in this place called Nicaea and said, you need to get this Jesus thing figured out. Who was this guy? Was he God? Was he man, et cetera, et cetera? Send him. I think under F on this, you want it to say Jesus divine. Oh yes, not define, divine. I want to blame that on um, spell check. Spell check, but I don't know that I can. But yeah. <laughs> so p part of it was to 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 get Jesus defined. What was his nature? Was he a human being? Was he a God that appeared in flesh? And in the end, uh, you know that the agreement was he was both divine and human. Okay? And then also, out of that, developed the very hard to understand and articulate doctrine of the Trinity. Okay? So again, the, the function, it was instruction. It was also to combat heresy, but mostly it was to instruct the people, to get something out there so that you all on the same page, you all agree, this is what the church agrees on. Okay? It was a very, probably, it might have been the most important creedal statement of the entire church. Okay, now, we're going to fast forward hundreds, hundreds of years, thousand years, to the next confessional document, which is the Scots Confession. And all of these confessions that follow come out of, because of the Protestant Reformation. Okay, so for years the Nicene Creed was that's what it was. That was it. There was also a, treat, a creed called the Athanasian Creed, but I'm honestly not very familiar with that creed. Are you guys? No. Mm -hmm. There was another one, but but basically those were the creeds until the Protestant Reformation. Okay, so the next one in our book is the Scots Confession, and that one came out in 1560, and it came out of Scotland, of course. Okay, because Scotland. That church there was a reformed church. The function there again was to defend orthodoxy, 
And the big thing was to unify, unify Scotland, which was warring between the Catholics and the Protestants. Finally, they, come, they came down and said, we're going to be Protestant in this country. And the church we're going to start is the Church of Scotland which in some ways looks a little bit like the Church of England, except it's not. <laughs> um, all right. Um, but that was the big reason. It was the Scottish Civil War, okay, and church order. Because there's a lot in the Scots Confession about, okay, if we're not going to be Anglicans, where we have bishops and archbishops and priests who run the thing, what's it going to look like? So the Scots Confession has a lot in it about church order. This is how, we're going to, this is how it's going to work. Makes sense? Steve. Jack Rogers' famous metaphor for the uh, Reformation the Protestants who were Presbyterian is that the Lutherans take the drawer out of Catholicism yeah. and the Episcopalians and they reach in and they pull a couple of things out. This is a dirty pair of underwear. This is an old sock. Yeah. This yeah. isn't a hanky that I didn't want. And so we're going to not accept everything about Mary, and we're not going to accept everything about saints, and we're not going to accept seven sacraments. We'll go back to two or whatever. They, they pick a few up. And what Roger says, what Knox and Calvin, those people do, they take the drawer out, they throw it on the floor. <laughs> they put the drawer back in, and then they say, now let's look at the Bible. What do I need to put back in? And they reach down and they say, well, this hanky really does talk about the two natures of Jesus. We need to put that one. And gee, there's something about grace here. We better really talk about grace. And here's something about church order. We'll put that in. So it's just a, it's just smaller. It's a refinement. And I say, and then the Anabaptists, like the Mennonites, they took the door out, stomped all over it, burned it up, and refused, and then got new furniture. <laughs> it was just, it was just, the Lutherans kept a lot, the Reform kept some, and the Midnight said, we're burning the house down, we're done. It's, this has got to look completely different. I think that's a pretty good metaphor. Sorry. Okay. All right. Now, thank you, Steve. That's really good. All right. So, on to the next one was the Heidelberg. And guess what country or what area that came from? The Heidelberg. Germany. German area, yeah, Germany. Um, so the Reformed Christians, not all, not all German people were Lutheran. There were, there's many were formed in that area. So the Heidelberg Catechism um, comes from that area, 1562, again, during the time of, of, of the, as the church was reforming. Um, and again, this was a teaching device this was meant to be a teaching device. And that's what uh, the longer and shorter catechisms are. They were meant to teach people, okay? Um, the other thing was, uh, the other big thing in the, in the Heidelberg, um, and you're gonna see that this caused a little bit of a church war. Um, the Heidelberg started to say, the Lutheran and Reform, they started to address the big, you guys, the big sticking point between Lutherans and Reformed churches, do you know what it is? It's not necessarily the way the worship service looks. The big doctrinal sticking point is communion. Did you know that? Because Lutherans and, this is where we don't agree. Because Lutherans, um, Lutherans understand um, the, the real presence of Christ is not in the bread and the wine, but all around it. Not, it's not in the bread and wine because then that would be idolatry, right? That God becomes this. So the Lutherans got, a, got the Lutherans differentiated themselves from the Catholics by saying, well, it doesn't become, but the, the real presence of Christ is all around the bread and the, and the uh, cup. And the Reformed Church says the real presence of Christ is there, but it's not confined to just around the elements. Okay? We talk about on Sunday, it's a little, we, we allow a lot of wiggle room. We say the real presence of Christ is with us as we come to the table and present to us. 
but we but we but we're not going to confine it the presence to the elements but you and i can go to a lutheran church and administer communion we can. since the 1990s but we have to do it their way <laughs> yeah you gotta learn a lot of literature yeah yeah but that's that is the big sticking point our, our government is a little bit different, but the theological sticking point is and always has been Holy Communion, and that was addressed in the Heidelberg Catechism. The problem is, then, is that it leaned a little too Lutheran for the Swiss and for the Scots. And out of that, the Second Helvetic Confession is where um, they, they, they start to get snarky about Lutheran Communion. Okay, so Frederick the Elector was the person, Sandy, here's your question. Frederick the Elector is the one that said he was, he was, he was like a German regional king or governor or something. He got the people together and said, you need to write a new, a new uh, doctrine. And that was the Heidelberg, okay? So, um, the problem was that then the Swiss didn't, they felt the Heidelberg had too much Lutheranism in it, okay? And so the second Helvetic comes from Switzerland, okay? And it addresses, it, I read it today, it kind of, it just dances all over the place when it's addressing the sacraments. But they, they must have done it so well that they thought, okay, we can let it go now. But they dance all around it, saying what it is, but not what it isn't. Okay? So that's the second Hel Helvetic. Yes, Laura? Was there a first Helvetic confession? Because all we reference here is There the must second. have been. There must have been. Okay, I don't that's know. That's, in yeah, it's, it's pr they probably do have a first Helvetic, but, but we only have a second one. And is that's that a great a question. I don't know. Is that year of 1561 correct? Because that would put it before the Heidelberg. I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand with that. Well, either that or maybe I don't know. That's maybe a good question. I don't know, but time. it's but the Second Helvetic is a response to that other. I may have gotten my dates wrong there. Yeah, this the Second Helvetic is a little <laughs> bit of a refutation of some of the stuff in the Heidelberg. But it's 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 reformed enough the Heidelberg that it landed in our Book of Confessions. Okay. Good question. I don't know. Okay, moving right along, then we're going to finish up here. The Westminster Confession and the longer and shorter catechisms count for three of our confessional statements. Okay, so there, there, there are three of them, but they all, they all belong together. Okay, so there's the Westminster Confession, and then there's these two teaching, it's like curriculum. That's a good way to describe it. It's like a, a long, long curriculum. And I understand, did anybody have to memorize the questions? Every once in a while I run into somebody who said, yeah, I had to memorize the shorter catechism. Well, the answers, you, the answers. There are colleges where if you can recite the whole shorter, yeah. the Q and the A, yeah. then you get a full a scholarship. Wow. There's like an endowment sitting there waiting for people. Wow, yeah. yeah. Our yeah. friend who was Christian Reformed, they memorized They had to memorize it, it. yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was, they, were, they were curriculum. They were curriculum. Okay. So this is interesting. This one, co this one comes out of England. Okay. In England, in 1649, again, um, the the country was was definitely moving away from the Roman Catholic Church. They were becoming a Protestant country. But within that Protestant country and the Empire, there were two groups. There was the State Church, the Church of England, and then there were these Presbyterians. Um, which actually I think was kind of a, a dirty nickname, I believe. But it was for the Reformed because they didn't li because the Presbyterians didn't like the hierarchical government in the Anglican Church, which was the issue going on with monarchs and all that stuff. Um, so they called them together. They called it the Westminster Divines, and they said, you, you need to write a new statement of faith for this Protestant country of ours. The Anglicans and the Presbyterians got together and did that. Okay. Um, Trying to see what else. And you know the whole the whole interesting history that you know Charles the First was beheaded. They got they said we're done with these kings. 
they were really looking very Protestant. They, they beheaded Charles I, and there was this period of like 12 years where there was no monarch, and it was run by this guy, Oliver Cromwell, who called himself the Lord Protector or something like that. So this 12 year period where they were like, we are really being ferocious democratic Protestants. We're done with these kings, we're done with this church, et cetera, et cetera. And they killed half the Irish. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, at any rate, at any rate um, what happened then was the English Puritans had to leave the country. They had to leave the country, especially as the next Charles' son, Charles II, came back into power. They, the Puritans left, and where did they come? America. To America. What did they bring with them? The Westminster Confession. And then later, the Scots, who were also a part of creating the Westminster Confession and took it back to Scotland, they started to show up as immigrants, right? So you had the Congregationalists, who back in that day were very reformed, and then you had the Scottish people, immigrants, coming over a little bit later, and the Westminster Confession ruled the day in this country for a long, long time. It was the creed of the Reformed Church and the Reformed Churches in America, okay? They called them the standards. It's interesting, Queen Elizabeth, 11 months of the year, she's Church of England, yeah. and then in August, she, she goes, becomes Scottish. Well, I don't know how she's traveling anywhere, but if she is, she goes to Balfour Castle Balmoral. in, uh, in Balmoral. Scotland, Scotland yeah. and she becomes for one month the well, she Well, Spirit. she also goes to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have this big, this big thing, and she comes and addresses, or lately, though, she sends... Zooms. She Well, she sends, she sends somebody else to represent her. But yeah, she becomes... She's, in, a, in some way, sort of the... She's not the head of the Church of Scotland, but... Kinda. It's weird. It's very weird. Yeah, you're right, Steve. Exactly. All right. But the, but the Westminster standards uh, were the creedal statement of the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists in in America for a long, long time. Okay. Until when? The 20th century. All right. Then the next one was the Theological Declaration of Barman. This is one of the most profound documents in the Book of Confessions. It came in 1934, it came out of Germany, and the function of it, the reason was because of the rise of Hitler and Nazism and his attempt to use the churches, Catholic, Reformed, and Lutheran, to empower him and to empower his complete takeover Germany and eventually Europe. Okay. And so they got several, I think there was five great theologians, Martin Niemöller and some others, who got together and wrote this, it's not very long, but this statement, and it is all about Jesus as Lord, and that everything is... Karl Barth, also Karl Barth. Karl Barth was one of them. Every, everything is subservient to Jesus as Lord. That Jesus is Lord of our lives, of the church, not Hitler, not our favorite political person or any of that. Not the state, not civil life, but Jesus. Jesus, the living Christ, is the Word of God, and, and to Him we have to be um, subservient and obedient. Okay? It's a really wonderful document, and one we especially need to hear now, for God's sakes. All right, guys, it's 8 o'clock. I'm going to call it a day or a night. And then we'll finish up with these last few confessions, and then we'll dig into the barn the next Tuesday. Okay. Any any questions from anybody online or in the room that this hi, is? You. Yes, Sarah. Hi. What, what's, I couldn't understand what you were saying. Which the, the last one at Westminster? What was it called? The Barman Declaration. The Barman. Uh -huh. Barman. Theological Declaration of Barman, 1934. Okay, thank you. Did you see it there? Yeah, yeah. It's, I'll tell you, it'll bring you to tears when you read it. And if you think about what was going on with Hitler, and, and you know, there were people who died because of that Barman Declaration, who well, put their lives on the line. The yeah. priests and the reform ministers were among the first, very first people put in the first concentration camps in 1934 and 35. Yeah. They were the first ones then. Yeah. 
They were killed because of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, gang. It's been a wonderful night. So we'll see you next Tuesday at, at seven. All right. Bye bye.